Coming up next on KPBS Evening Edition, a new earthquake study could help determine the future of the San Onofre nuclear power plant. And a controversial new report says San Diego's efforts to become water independent could be very costly to rate players. Plus, Camp Pendleton is the site of a reported first for gays in the military. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Peggy Pico. The company that runs the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station is about to start a study that could determine the plant's future. Southern California Edison is teaming up with the Scripps Institution of Oceanography to study offshore earthquake faults and the risk they pose to the plant's reactors. Those reactors have been shut down for nearly three months because of a mechanical problem. This weekend, anti-nuclear activists plan a march and rally to demand the plant's permanent closure. A report critical of San Diego County Water Authority was officially released this week. It was commissioned by other Southern California water agencies to discredit San Diego's investment in independent water sources. KPBS reporter Allison St. John joins us with more on this complicated issue. And Allison, CWA, San Diego's water agency, already released information about this report. What's going on here? Well, Peggy, this report is kind of like a smoking gun about a war going on over water, which is the lifeblood of Southern California. And this week, this report was officially released, though our water agency, CWA, has already fired off a salvo against it, saying it's simply a conspiracy to discredit San Diego. San Diego is in a legal battle with the Southern California Regional Water Authority, that's MWD, over the cost of water. And one interesting strand of the story is that a co-author of this report is a San Diego professor of political science from UCSD, Steve Erie. And many have questioned why a San Diegan would write something that undermines our water authority. What does Erie actually say? Well, he says he was paid by the Los Angeles Economic Development Corporation and that he had no idea the money was coming from the other water agencies fighting over water rights. And what does Erie say that are the main drivers of the cost increases for San Diego's water? He says it's San Diego's decisions to invest in independent water supplies that are costing money. Firstly, the contract to use water from Imperial Valley. Secondly, uh, construction costs for emergency water storage. And then also conservation programs that do cost the agency money. So he asks, what price independence? He says it would have been cheaper to just depend on MWD's water. Well, as you mentioned, San Diego County Water Authority argues this is all wrong. Why do you think? Well, the CWA says this is part of a strategy to keep charging San Diego water rates higher and forcing us to subsidize other Southern, Southern California cities and counties. So they argue that the investments are worth every penny because in the long run, San Diego doesn't want to rely on MWD's water. So they say that over time, these investments will be cheaper than relying on MWD. Well, I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more about that. KPBS reporter Allison St. John, thank you. A settlement could keep the Utility Consumers Action Network, or UCAN, from disbanding. The consumer group filed for a court dissolution back in February amid charges of financial irregularities. The tentative settlement would allow UCAN to continue under new leadership. The deal will go to a judge next month. And California voters could be asked to make a change to the state's three strikes law. The proposed change would require a third strike to be for violent or serious offense. Supporters of the change have turned in petitions to it uh, to get it on the November ballot. Those petitions are being verified by the Secretary of State. In January 1998, the family of Stephanie Crow found the 12-year-old girl stabbed to death on her bedroom floor. Her brother, Michael, and two high school friends in Escondido were falsely arrested and charged. But the case fell apart when Stephanie's blood was discovered on the clothing of a prowler reported in the neighborhood that night. Richard Tewitt was convicted and imprisoned for the murder in 2004. Now the Crow family recently settled a federal lawsuit against police for more than $7 million. But the marathon case isn't over yet. Joining me is KPBS senior editor Mark Sauer. He's been covering the Crow case since it started. And Mark, why is Michael Crow's attorney back in court now? 
It's a, a rare hearing in which attorney Milt Silverman is seeking a formal ruling of factual innocence for Michael Crow. That would officially clear his name and erase all records of his arrest. Well, what are the high points of this uh, two-day hearing? A retired judge, uh, Laura Hamas, testified that the video she reviewed of the teens being interrogated by Escondido police were stunning and examples of mental abuse. Also, the sheriff's detective who made the case against Tuit Vic Coloca said he was sink sickened and lost sleep over what Escondido detectives had done in the interrogations. Moving forward to now, what happens next? It'll be up to uh, Superior Court Judge Kenneth So to decide whether to grant the Crow family's re request for factual innocence. All right, KPBS Senior News Editor Mark Sauer, thank you. We're learning a little more tonight about the dairy cow found to have mad cow disease in Central California. Federal officials say she was very old for a milk producer and was euthanized after becoming unable to stand. They say the cow developed the disease from a rare random mutation and they say there's no risk to the food supply. Work is now underway on a major expansion at Scripps Memorial Hospital in Encinitas. The hospital is adding a new critical care building, which will be more than double the size of its current emergency room of 12 beds. The main hospital will also get a lot more beds. The new additions are expected to open in the summer of 2014. Thousands of San Diegans are expected to roll up their sleeves and wade into a huge watershed cleanup project tomorrow. I Love a Clean San Diego is holding its 10th annual Creek to Bay cleanup. About 5,500 volunteers are expected at more than 80 sites where they'll paint over graffiti and pick up all kinds of trash. Break cans, plastic, bottles. Part of a braking system to a car. Part of a TV. Grocery car. Some sort of mesh netting, stuff that has just a lot of plastic. Clearly this is, this is the pathway to the, uh, to the bay. So all this stuff that we're finding here, if we don't uh, pick it up, it's going to eventually get into the bay. If you want to volunteer, you can still register online at creektobay.org. Business leaders in Hillcrest want to raise a rainbow flag over their neighborhood to symbolize gay pride. They're asking the city council to approve a 65-foot tall flagpole at the intersection of Normal Street and University. The Planning Commission has already recommended a no vote, but the final decision rests with the council. A Navy veteran and an active duty Marine may be the first gay couple to ever have gotten publicly engaged on a military installation. It happened this week when Corey Hudson proposed to Avarice Guerrero at Camp Pendleton. Guerrero had just returned from a 10-month deployment to Afghanistan. Coming up on Evening Edition, a look at some of this week's big stories. And a bit later, thanks to the Internet, cartoonist no longer have to live in big cities and have their work published in newspapers with big circulations. We'll talk with some successful webcomic artists here in San Diego to find out what it takes to get a webcomic online. This is KPBS Evening Edition. Tonight on KPBS. At 8, PBS's longest-running public affairs series, featuring Washington's top journalists analyzing the week's news and its effect on the lives of all Americans. Washington Week. Then at 8.30, broadcast media and the web unite to bring you a new kind of news gathering and reporting with input from an engaged audience on Need to Know. And at 9, how a newly elected president with a mandate for change grappled with Wall Street on Frontline. That's tonight on KPBS. He was the world's fastest human. The quintessential Olympic hero. But his triumph was in more than just a race. The Olympics were to be a symbol of German racial superiority. Hitler was absolutely livid. After winning all the gold medals, he expected the whole nation to love him. And here, the greatest athlete in America is being treated shabbily. Jesse Owens on American Experience. Tuesday at 8 on KPBS. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by
San Diego mayoral candidate Nathan Fletcher's surprising switch of his political party seems to have paid off after he jumped from being a Republican to an independent. Nearly 40 business leaders followed his lead. But the question remains, will voters follow along? And an overwhelming vote by San Diego's hotel owners will raise room tax by up to 15 percent to pay for an expanding uh, expansion of the convention center, though it's not exactly a done deal. Joining me to talk about these stories today is J.W. August, the managing editor of our media partner, Channel 10 News, and our own KPBS Metro reporter, Katie Orr. Thank you both for joining us. And Katie, let's start with you. We have a lot to cover here. Basically, is there a reason Fletcher says for why he switched parties? Well, he says he switched because the parties have become too partisan. It didn't allow him to work across the aisles and he felt constricted by it. Uh, depending on who you talk to, th there are those who say he actually left the Republican Party after he didn't get the local GOP nomination. But he says it's something that he's been struggling with for quite a few years. Well, let's listen to what he had to say for himself about his switch. I'll be willing to work with people to solve problems, to move us forward, because the current environment is broken, uh, and, and regular folks are demanding something better. They're demanding a mayor who's going to actually rebuild our city, a mayor who's going to actually move us into a better future. Okay, so that's what he had to say to himself. So, J.W., 40 other business leaders quickly followed suit, switching to independent. My question to you is, what's in it for them, if anything? Well, I think uh, they're closet Nathanites. They all support what he does. And I think they sense, like a lot of us do, that there's a, a, a great deal of uh, mistrust of both parties, and not just here, but the state level and the national level, that they can't get things done, and maybe this is the answer. So in getting things done, Katie, will this have any kind of impact on local politics or is it sort of just a... Um uh, a ploy, I guess, for, for the mayoral race. I mean, it remains to be seen. As you said, it will be interesting to see if people who say they're supporting him now, he did get a big jump in the polls, a poll that 10 News did. He got a big bump after he announced that he was switching. But it remains to be seen whether or not those people actually go to the polls on Election Day and vote for him. That'll be that'll be the, the truth when the end of it comes. Now, I do have a question for both of you. So Fletcher talks about a lot of this movement to the middle that he's trying to to, you know, bypass the gridlock. First, Katie, let me ask you, movement to the middle, is it real? Do you, is that what you're hearing out? Well, I think it taps into a feeling that a lot of voters have, that they don't really feel like they identify with either party anymore, and that maybe their views are a little bit more moderate than they see represented out there. So I think it does speak to some real concerns. Right. Catchphrase, J.W.? Yeah, it or? is a catchphrase. It's a branding. I think a more honest phrase would be independent or decline to state, because you can feel something. You could be, you know, sort of right wing on one thing and left wing on the other. You know, you might be an environmentalist who believes in fiscal responsibility, and and that's possible. And there was some criticism, obviously, from the Republican Party when he switched mm. over. What are local politicians saying now about this switch? Go ahead, Katie. Well, there, uh, you know, obviously his uh, Republican opponents say it's just grandstanding. He's trying to keep his name in the media. He got a lot of attention, national media attention, after he left the GOP and started running as an independent candidate. They say this is just his way of trying to extend that 15 minutes. And what are you hearing from the city same, council? Same thing. Neener, neener, neener. You shouldn't have done it. You, you weren't good enough to stay in there with the Republicans, so shame on you. Okay. Any support from local politicians? Oh, uh, sure. Yeah, he does have support. Yeah, he's gotten the endorsement of not politicians, but the police union. He's right. gotten all these CEOs. I mean, they're not elected, but they're powerful business people in the community. There are people from Qualcomm, Ir Irwin Jacobs' sons. Right. Uh, Paul Jacobs was, was one of the people supporting this. Um, a lot of the Brian Malarkey, who's a, a local chef, has... Watt, Watt, Watt Industries. Right, absolutely. Right. So there is definitely some business backing to this move. And that may... Well, we will see <laughs> on Election Day how that worked out. Now, there's a very... There's another hot topic surrounding voters in San Diego. This one comes from San Diego hotel owners who push for a room tax hike of up to 15 percent to pay for the expansion of the San Diego Convention Center. And Katie, now you've been following this for at least a year. Um, my question to you is why such an overwhelming yes vote? I mean, there was yeah, and I think we should clarify, this would, uh, the increase would be between 1 and 3 percent, and would, it would raise the downtown hotel rate to 15.5 percent uh, for a hotel uh, downtown. Um, 
you know, basically they want to see a convention center built. A bigger convention center means bigger conventions here, more lucrative conventions here. The phrase is always heads in beds, right? So if you have a bigger convention center, you can get more heads in beds of hoteliers, which is good for them. Um, and also they were uh, basically given more power over the convention center. The private convention and visitors bureau now has booking for long-term planning at the convention center, uh, which gives a lot more power to hoteliers. And as you clarified, it's up to 15 or 15.5% after a 1% to 3% uh, increase. Right. So, JW, why the range on this? Why not just say we want 2% on top of everything? Well, because they wanted to get the hotelers further out from the convention center to buy into it, so they cut them a deal. You pay less, you, you raise less, and the closer you get to the convention center, you pay more because you're going to have, uh, you're going to benefit more from the, 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 the increase of the size of the convention center. So sort of expanding the real estate of the impact right. of that, mm -hmm. so to be able to do that. So Katie, is this legal? I mean, it seems like this should be a public vote. Well, uh, the city uh, leaders, the mayor believes it is. The city attorney has expressed some skepticism, so he is asking a judge uh, to validate it. He's going to file a validation suit asking for a judge to see whether or not this is, in fact, a legal plan, because the original construction of the convention center and the second expansion did go to a public vote. So the question becomes, well, then why is this different? Why is it separate? Well, and then that leads me to ask you, do you think that this hotel vote really means it's an imminent yes on having the expansion of the convention center paid for and nothing is an imminent yes in this city and mm -hmm. neither is this it's going to take a while to sort this out get the court to come back and who said maybe somebody will sue when they go ahead and move forward if the if the court rules in this particular case, you right. don't know. And they still have to get the uh, Coastal Commission approval. Right. Um, and it, it isn't. It isn't certain. The city attorney said the validation process could take up to a year. Uh, proponents of the expansion were hoping to break ground by the end of this year. Right. So uh, I don't know. I if wouldn't start that. booking rooms yet. Right. <laughs> right. Well, we were talking about this just a, a few minutes ago. You were talking about we, we keep hearing the convention center is packed, packed, packed. But is it necessarily? Is it really? Uh, that's the way it's been sold to us. I spoke to uh, Steve Cushman, who is uh, leading the task force to get this expansion, expansion together, he told me actually it's about 70% booked and they have about a 30% vacancy rate. You know, and I don't know the particulars of how far in advance you book a convention and, and you know, what, what the last minute events are in there. However, we've always been told that it's been booked right. and that's why we need to build it. Uh, we need it to be bigger. It's also a space issue. Comic-Con's running out of space. They want more space right. to have bigger conventions. Yeah, we there. hear about that a lot. So one thing I wanted to ask you, JW, is with a new convention center, let's say it goes through, there's going to be construction jobs, all sorts of jobs. So why, are, why is labor union opposed to this? Uh, because once the construction jobs go away, assuming that they're union jobs, that the jobs left are going to be service uh, jobs, and those jobs do not pay well. And what it's not a living wage, not in this city, not with the cost of living here and the housing. So the kind of jobs we're going to get, maybe in the management of the uh, expansion, there may be a decent living, but not to folks that have to keep the place clean. And that brings me to the, the, you know, this might be important to the owners, this might be important to hotel owners, things like that, but to the taxpayers, what benefits them, Katie? Well, the city benefits, if everything goes the way that proponents say it will, we'll get more people in here, that will generate more hotel tax revenue, and a portion of that will go into the city's general fund. So sort of the rising tide lifts all boats argument. More people equals more general tax revenue. However, there are those people who say, what if it doesn't? go the way you planned. We fund this expansion, we don't get the TOT to cover it, and the city's on the hook for maybe a larger amount than it thought it would be. Do you agree with that? Uh, absolutely, and the problem is there's always a thing when they say it's going to cost this much to build, they always find something that they got to spend more money on, you know, like they didn't count for the escalators or the windows, or oh, we forgot <laughs> about that. Right, well, and we're being told this is about a $520 million project, but critics have pointed out that doesn't take into account the interest on the bonds that you're going to have to take uh, out, so it could be actually mm -hmm. over a billion dollars by the time you factor in all the interest. Right, so almost double mm -hmm. when you factor in every bit of it. One, we've got about one minute left. Now, the city council has yet to sign off on this tax increase. I, I want to get both of your feel. Uh, let me start, JW, your feel for if they're going to or not. Oh, yeah, I think so, absolutely. Mm -hmm. right. They've been pretty supportive of this project uh, step by step. Pe critics have said one of the criticisms of it is that it's very piecemeal. It comes to them in little bits mm -hmm. uh, and not all at once, which makes it easier to get it passed. But they've been very overwhelmingly supportive of the project up until this point. So there's no reason to think they would get that far and then turn their back on it. No. And 
very quickly what's next for this, the next step. Uh, they're going to court. Yeah, going mm -hmm. to court. We're going to see what happens. And then there's other things after that. So next mm -hmm. step, court, yeah. and we'll go from there. Mm -hmm. Katie Orr, J.W. August, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next News Hour, the student loan debate plus Shields and Brooks. That's Friday on the PBS News Hour. Hi, I'm Yul Kwan from the new PBS series, America Revealed. Make Wednesdays your destination for exploration. First, see what it takes to survive the first days of life in the wild on nature. Next, on Nova, can a computer beat the best contestants on Jeopardy? Then, join me for America Reveal and see how we are all part of a new industrial revolution. This Wednesday, PBS is your destination for exploration. The American people have named PBS the most trusted source of news and public affairs for the eighth year in a row. Trust. The American people have spoken. Thank you. Web comics let artists create online comics from anywhere that has electricity, computers, and the internet. KPBS arts reporter Beth Accomando profiles two San Diego based web comic artists. San Diego artists Paul Horn and Rebecca Hicks describe themselves as cartoonists. Hicks is the creator of Little Vampires. The Little Vampires came from a random comment my husband made about his diabetes, about his fingertips, because he's always checking his blood sugar. So he's like, yeah, my fingers look like they're being nibbled by Little Vampires. Cute Little Vampires. My elevator pitch for Little Vampires is they're literally Little Vampires, and they try really hard to be like big and fierce vampires, and they fail spectacularly at it. Horn writes and illustrates Cool Jerk. The easiest way to, to describe Cool Jerk is that it's the exact opposite of Family Circus. Right now, too dangerous, probably, for, uh, for newspapers. Which is fine, because neither Cool Jerk nor Little Vampires appears in a newspaper. You can just navigate the site using the little navigator tools up here. Cool Jerk and Little Vampires are web comics, which means they're published first online. The first web comic debuted in the mid-80s, but the format wouldn't take off for another decade. Cool Jerk and Little Vampires are just two out of tens of thousands of web comics now available online. For Hicks, the new format was about gaining access. If there was, and I'm not saying there was, but if there was any kind of, oh, we can't let the girls do comic strips attitude, it's, it doesn't exist in webcomics because there is no group of men or women saying, oh, no, yours has not really got, you know, wide appeal. Really, we all throw our work up there, and the stuff that sticks is the stuff that sticks, but is determined not by, once again, a small group of people, but by, well, the entire world in some cases. And there's one more difference. I think the difference is in the innovation. This is, this is the new technology. This is um, the new form of entertainment. And so that means that you're going to see some new cool stuff. I think webcomics are way more exciting than comic books now, and that's really hard for me to say. Part of that excitement comes from greater freedom for artists who are now their own bosses. There's no publisher worrying about ads or circulation to tell them what they can or can't do. It also means anyone with a computer and Internet access can start their own site. It is not necessarily difficult to get to break into the industry, but to make an income at it is, that's tough. In fact, Cool Jerk's website is more about getting and keeping fans than generating income. I don't sell advertising and the site nets zero money, which is fine. I've been okay with that. So to make the money to continue with following the dream and all of that is, uh, you know, I, pub I publish books. Does that line up the way it should? Yeah, it, it does. <laughs> like Horn's Cool Jerk. Hicks's website is not a source of income. Uh, my income comes through going to conventions and selling merchandise based on my work, selling art prints, you know, of, of my uh, original art and uh, any little thing I can slap a little vampire on. Or taking on commissions. And so things like logo design, um, I've done some like 
newspaper slash magazine type covers. I'm doing a picture book for a chiropractor. That's the nicest thing about conventions is you never know who you're going to run into. I like your style. I'd like you to do um, some work for me. I'm like, I'd like you to pay. Deal. It was part, It was awesome. I'm like, okay, never saw that one coming. Hicks finds that the best way to build her business is often one person at a time at conventions. The old school approach also applies to how they create their art. I still do my strip the way I have for nearly 25 years, and that is uh, with brush and ink. Hicks works in similar fashion. So I start with the pencils and just make sure that everything, f basically make sure everything fits. Then I go over with the ink pen, which is the most nerve-wracking part of the process for me because, ooh, you can't erase. Though actually you can. If I do a line and then I'm like, mm, when I look at it later, that didn't really come out so good. I can fix it in Photoshop, but I try not to rely on that. I use uh, Photoshop for the coloring. Eventually, this will be a little vampire webcomic. Uh, Wolfie is thinking about how easy it's going to be to babysit his baby sister. You know, baby plus duct tape, easy. But like babysitting, a webcomic is never quite as easy as it might seem. That was KPBS arts reporter Beth Accomando. You can learn more about web comics on her Cinema Junkie blog at kpbs.org. Tonight in our public square, we got lots of comments on our story about freeway lids or concrete shelves that cover a sunken freeway to allow green space on top of it. From our KBBS website, Parker Bray says, I was just thinking how great it would be around Balboa Park if the 163 was covered up somehow. I didn't realize the term freeway lid existed. Let's put one down there. And from our KPBS Facebook page, Dave B says, seriously? Can we get potholes fixed first, perhaps? And if we have any money left, there are a lot of people who were promised an unfunded pie in the sky when they retire. We need to pay for that, too. If we have any money left after that, what about fixing our crumbling sewage system? Water reserves? Fire department? Police? Just saving up for a rainy day. Sheesh. Freeway lids. You can weigh in on this story or others by following us on Twitter, liking us on Facebook, and of course you can email us at news at kpbs.org. Recapping some of tonight's top stories, the operators of the San Onofre nuclear power plant are starting research into offshore seismic activity. Southern California Edison is teaming up with Scripps Institution of Oceanography to research faults near the seaside plant. The announcement comes as anti-nuclear activists plan a weekend rally to demand closure of San Onofre. And thousands of San Diegans are expected to pitch in for a countywide cleanup tomorrow morning. Volunteers with the Creek to Bay cleanup will pick up trash at 88 sites to keep that debris from floating down to the ocean. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you for joining us and have a great weekend. We leave you with a look at the three-day forecast.